the audience, we thank you all for coming to our uh, kickoff lecture of the series this fall. And in particular, um, wittingly or unwittingly participating in our sort of small experiment of kind of blended hybrid uh, conversation. So um, we've done a number of these Zoom or remote lectures, and some of you have watched them online. Uh, we're streaming online as well now, and we will, of course, take questions online via Pubble, as we have in the, plat in the past as an online platform. But we also wanted to experiment with an opportunity to actually be able to, in a way, um, have a, a, a bit more proximity with the speakers and also be able to um, ask them questions about what they're going to share with us um, momentarily. So again, thank you for uh, signing on to this little experiment, and I look forward to a very productive conversation with all of you who are here in this room, as well as those uh, who um, will be watching online. So again, um, welcome to um, Dan and Marie. I first have to say, I guess I first found out about some of the early research that they started in their studio when I was more or less uh, in your shoes uh, in school, and I think Dan was maybe even a TA or teaching assistant. And uh, you know, always super helpful, and you're always you know, you're preoccupied with your studio projects. And somehow, through the grapevine here or there, I kind of got this bit of information that he was studying salt. And I was like trying to understand what it, what, what it actually meant, right? We were in architecture school. Everyone's focused on what they're designing, what is the building, where's their site. And he was just sort of researching salt. And I, I couldn't quite understand, is it a salt mine or is it something made out of salt? And, uh, and obviously, as I got to have a bit more understanding, um, I realized that it was a, um, uh, an extremely nuanced and kind of complexified, not only investigation into various aspects of salt, um, but also a very sort of provocative uh, approach to actually interrogating what does it mean to conduct research uh, within the field of architecture, within the fields of environmental design. Um, so I'm going to actually share a little bit about how Landing Studio um, describes themselves by way of introducing them uh, virtually from through this sort of wormhole between uh, Somerville, Massachusetts, and uh, Happy Valley in central Pennsylvania. Landing Studio is an architecture and urban design practice focused on improving the human experience and integrating natural systems in infrastructural and industrial environments. We specialize in navigating the complexities of active uses and work with stakeholders from community groups to public agencies, industrial businesses, environmental advocates, to create inviting and connected environments that support local communities. Our work includes buildings under highway spaces, marine docks, bridge lighting, public works depots, green infrastructure, and public parks. Landing Studio is a uh, one of these sort of emerging practices, which is continuing to garner uh, more and more national and international recognition. Um, they received awards, including from Progressive Architecture, uh, the Architectural League, League Prize, um, AIA Institute Honor Awards, Waterfront Center Awards, and an APA Gold Award. Um, I believe that today they're going to speak with us about just infrastructure, and I will now welcome to the stage uh, Landing Studio. Welcome, Dan and Marie. Uh, thank you so much, DK, um, and thank you to Penn State. Um, I'm Marie. <coughs> Hi, I'm Dan Adams. And we're so um, you know, pleased to have the opportunity to share our work here with you. Um, we are going to just start by saying you know, we take the opportunity of, of sharing to really reflect on what it is that we're doing. And 
Um, this time when we were thinking about this lecture, we just started to create a little map of the projects that we're working on in our office and some of the things that we'll be showing today. And we thought this was an interesting way just to kind of start to introduce our work. Um, somewhere in the middle of the screen, you can see a little LS. That's where we are today. That's Somerville, Massachusetts. And then um, some of you might recognize that this is um, downtown Boston here. And then all of the red rectangles floating around are, are different project sites that um, we have in the office. And it made us really kind of realize that we're doing a lot of work on all of the kind of riverways and waterways in Boston. Um, we tend to work on industrial waterfronts. Um, we work where highways kind of come close to rivers and um, often separate communities from natural resources. Um, all of the projects are on filled tide lands. So there's a lot of a big history of, of making land in Boston. And so there's a lot of environmental challenges and physical design challenges that are sort of common throughout all of all of these things that we'll kind of get into. Um, they're all within about four miles uh, of each other and within us, which I guess I'd say is something we kind of cherish in our work. Uh, we have some projects that are sort of further afield, but uh, in many ways we'd sort of call our core projects ones that we kind of can interact with uh, every day and with the people in those communities every day. So as um, DK was kind of saying, our, the actual kind of mediums that we engage with in our work are, are kind of, there's a range. Um, we do architecture, we make buildings, we also do temporary installations, we work over different time scales, um, very short and often very long in terms of, of really trying to transform environment, infrastructure environments. Uh, we do a lot of work with lighting installations and um, we'll be showing a little bit of all of these these things today and we've titled the talk um, just infrastructure and i guess I, I just wanted to say a little bit more about our team landing studios uh, a small practice uh, we have five people today um, so we want to kind of shout out to ryan simon and christopher as um, our current team and we're really grateful for all of the um, great work that they do on these projects that you'll be seeing um, just infrastructure to us means, you know, we look at spaces of infrastructure and try to think about how do we better reflect the priorities of the communities that are most directly impacted by them and also integrate uh, natural systems and promote the health of the planet through um, better uh, design with natural, um, natural processes. Um, there's, you know, obviously a, a very, um, strong history of infrastructure being designed um, in ways that doesn't that really harms local communities and so we're looking for what are the ways as architects and physical designers that we can actually improve those uh, relationships and so we'll look at in different projects a kind of um, range of ways that we've we've started to work in that realm <clears throat> yeah and i guess the sort of the other you know you never know what to title a lecture because <laughs> you're trying to sum up a lot of work in a in a couple words and the other sort of side of the just infrastructure that we liked is sort of an oxymoron or a play on the negative of like there can never be like just infrastructure um both in the sense of it can never you know it's like a quest that never ends you can maybe get better or closer but it can never be a fully just infrastructure and on the other hand it's never about just the infrastructure and in fact the infrastructure we've discovered in our projects almost becomes the thing it, it isn't about um, and that when DK uh, who by the way DK I'm so happy to reconnect uh, it's 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 been a few years I'm very happy to see you again by the way um, but he mentioned you know we started with this exploration of salt and that was in many ways kicked off because we ran into some very interesting people in Chelsea Massachusetts I'm not going to get into the details we studied this city for a number of years but it has these kinds of conditions. This is a salt port in Chelsea, Massachusetts. And what you can see is that very sort of proximate relationship between sort of a heavy global scale industry and a, uh, in fact, what is a hyper dense urban community. And they're kind of colliding right on top of each other. And the thing that was so compelling about salt to us in many ways is actually that salt is, is sort of nothing. It's like talking about the air. It's a, ubiquitous material it's essentially everywhere on earth 
it's in the oceans, it's in our blood, it's in our sweat. If we don't eat it, we die. It's, um, it's a fundamental mineral of earth. In fact, it's the most utilized mineral on earth for industrial purposes. And yet nobody thinks or talks about it, uh, <clears throat> because it's so abundant. It's not like petroleum or something like this. And so it's really about like, um, studying everything that impacts salt and the relationships of it. And in the case of Chelsea, Massachusetts here, which is the smallest municipality in Massachusetts, you know, you get these kind of intense global convergence of global industry bringing tons of salt. And yet it lands in like very local environments and with people and how do people interrelate to these systems that on their face are so sort of abstract and industrial. So little Chelsea, Massachusetts, which is just 1.8 square miles in plan area. Uh, this is the global network that feeds um, Chelsea, Massachusetts, uh, all of salts from around the world. And what we were looking at, and it was really instigated by just some simple conversations with people on the ground, particularly terminal managers who had been operating in the city for 50 years. And they, they said, you know, we have this really fraught relationship with the city, with the city. we're here. Um, everybody knows us. A lot of people have worked for us. We sustain families. A lot of people hate us. A lot of people are trying to get rid of us because we're this sort of messy, unliked, unattractive industry. And, and so it's this like really complicated relationship. And I think what became clear to us as designers was it wasn't about a physical artifact. It was about this relationship. And, you know, just to give a few you know, perceptions from the community. This is right up the street and, you know, you're looking down, you know, you're basically from your bedroom window down the street and in the summer, the salt's not there. A shipment of Mexican salt, which has been freshly evaporated from the ocean arrives, a shipment of Northern Irish salt that's been mined from deep underground, a shipment of surface salt from Chile, like every day, and this can change every 12 hours because that's how fast that these ships can discharge here changes the horizon of the city. And so you see sort of the intimacy. Uh, and over time, you get this sort of global stratigraphy of uh, um, almost this like global palimpsest or <clears throat> aggregation in time. Um, and I think one of the things that really compelled us, as opposed to many industries that have been sort of displaced and hidden from cities, this still exists and people confront it every day. And it's maybe the way we confront our industry and we're used to it as sort of this other um, element. And, and so while we were studying our kind of local context and local relationship with industry, we started, uh, we got a fellowship to sort of um, support studying of salt industry landscapes around the world uh, for about a three year period, looking at the relationship of this very neutral material, almost like a placebo to kind of just test how different contexts and communities build relationships to their industrial and infrastructural footprint. And we didn't set out to kind of find such stark and comparable juxtapositions, but it really became something we sort of found very informative to our work was to start seeing how the exact same, you know, industry and industrial product could manifest completely differently in different contexts and different communities. And it became a way for us to sort of extract all those other systems that make uh, an architecture, a physical form, part of an environment and part of a community. And so some very quick examples, the Atacama Desert, which is famed as a mineral extraction resource. The U.S. really started by mining nitrates for fertilizers and um, explosives. <clears throat> it's now known for gold and silver and copper, lithium and salt. And it, it's this kind of amazing climate because where you're seeing the salt mine in the bottom right, it has not rained for 10,000 years by geologic record. There's a unique climactic condition which keeps minerals incredibly pure right on the surface of the earth. And it's, it's a sort of brutally efficient process. You could say pure industrial efficiency. They blast the earth, hyper pure resource. This visit was very, sort of momentous because this mine was a new mine and this was right when they were hitting 1 million tons which in the state of massachusetts as in pennsylvania we de-ice our roadways with salt so all of this salt is being used to just de-ice our roads what an absurd sort of concept is to change the chemistry of a road so it doesn't freeze we mix you know tens of thousands of year old salts with the road to change its chemistry so it doesn't 
And here at this moment, they were hitting a million tons, which is what Massachusetts uses every year. So it was also these lessons of sort of global footprints that Massachusetts creates this every year somewhere. And it's this kind of, uh, you know, classic industrial efficiency of minimizing labor inputs, extracting from a hyper efficient landscape, shipping it over the ocean and delivering it <coughs> to our, so to our use, let's say. Um, and then, you know, we were also working and studying this site in Northern Ireland, uh, actually owned by the same company. It's the exact same operation. What makes this radically different is this operation is a thousand feet underground. Uh, they're evaporating an ocean called the Permian Sea, which predates the Atlantic. And, you know, just as the Atlantic and Pacific will someday evaporate, this ocean evaporate and left this crust to salt. And it's an exploration company because they're geologically digging through the earth. Same process, but obviously the complexities of working a thousand feet underground, it's you have to actually leave most of the salt to simply hold up the earth above you as you carve through. So it's almost like hyper inefficient here to mine. And it, it was kind of, and it, it rains every day here. Salt obviously hates rain. It dissolves in the rain. Well, salt loves rain, but it kind of hates rain too. And here you're seeing 1300 tons per hour, you know, shot out of the earth, again, shipped across, in this case, the United States. And, and we kind of questioned how could these kind of two systems intersect in Boston? How could those like efficiencies, uh, complement each other? One Chile where the climate is so brutally efficient and here, and you realize it's part of a geoeconomic system where the proximity of Northern Ireland to the U.S. circumvents the Panama Canal. And so you start realizing that, no, again, it's nothing about the salt. It's about paying the toll at the Panama Canal, which for a ship of these sizes is, you know, in around the half million dollar range. And so it offsets the efficiencies of the climate in Chile to mine in Northern Ireland. And so it starts teaching us these lessons of that, like what's dictating the relationship of infrastructure in those places is you know, climate and environment, and it's a sensitive calibration to that, or is it a sensitive calibration to the sort of geoeconomics? And those were very people-less environments, I would say. Both terminals are effectively operated by 10 to 20 people for this huge extractive industry. And then we juxtapose that to places like Ile de Ré, where, you know, a beautiful island off the coast of France, and they've calibrated over thousands of years sort of an agricultural salt production system with these hypersensitive canals. Uh, this slide we love because when you really want a robust flow of water, you remove the shingle. And when you want a really sensitive flow, you remove the cork. It's like that calibrated. And the soils are a clay-based soil that prevents the saturation of the ground to sustain the water above. So it's a super delicate relationship between the geology and the sediments, clay with the, the, the sort of water level, with the wind patterns. And it's beautiful and there's people who come and this person, he's a journalist and after writing articles, he comes and he harvests salt and it's called the fleur de salt, fleur de sel, because the salt crystallizes in flowers that they scrape off. And where in Chile and Northern Ireland, labor is sort of suppressed for the efficiency of industry here, the entire industry is about labor because it's all about how you create a brand around the image of labor, around this beautiful process. And that process creates a product which is globally distributed at unbelievable costs. You know, this is like 10 bucks for 250 grams. 10 bucks in Chile can buy you 4,000 pounds of salt. Same product, salt's the same. It's sodium chloride in both locations. So here there's this like cultural embedment, all predicated on this kind of organic nature that all falls apart when you look at the sort of distribution system, which is all by airplane which is obviously the most fuel intensive, least sustainable transportation methods for products and goods. But yet that kind of, that brand of the organic character brings people for food tourism. They even participate in the harvesting of the salt because it's sort of so beautiful and it's so branded. And then you like take that exact same labor equation and that exact same product to a different part of the world. And, you know, same density of labor, same beautiful relationship between the clay and the level of the water and the whole identity changes. Here in India, we were looking at facilities in Mumbai and Sambahar uh, in a dense labor equation, uh, sort of nomadic communities moving between salt pans throughout the year, evaporating salt, harvesting it. And the product is radically different, you know, instead of super valued high cuisine salt sold in all the nicest restaurants around the world 
it's government rations, which are distributed to people to prevent things like goiter and distribute iodine for basic nutrition to people. And it's part of a government bureaucracy. The way we provide water in U.S. cities, salt is a fundamental provision. And those kinds of lessons of how cultural embedment, environmental systems, geoeconomics become dictating of a community, the sort of incredible symbolism that these basic infrastructural elements, again, something like salt, which is effectively nothing. It's, it's like talking about just like rocks. It's just um, can take on, in this case, in India, the kind of um, super monumentality brought by Gandhi's major protests, which sort of disturbed the British monopolies by simply bending over to pick up salt and eat it versus the hyper branded sort of monetization of salt in Ile de Ray. What they served as lessons for us is how we could look at infrastructural and industrial environments and essentially develop ways of re-articulating that relationship. Because what we could see through SALT is all the ways that an infrastructure and industrial system could become kind of nuanced and integrated in cultures and communities and geographies in diverse ways. Yeah, so all of this work, um, while we were traveling and, and kind of learning about SALT production and the, the kind of industrial processes of, of mining SALT, we were also working more locally and working on um, temporary projects, um, installations like what you see here. Uh, this is a film and performance art festival that we did every two years for several years um, in Staten Island and just experimenting with the material. Uh, we learned, you know, through this travel that it's it's really just a very natural material. It's something that you can engage with your hands, your body. And so we started to construct these salt stages, um, as we called them, to support art installations for this, um, this event um, and began to see how different artists worked with the material, used it to kind of support their, um, their practice, um, some of them engaging it with very directly as kind of a medium within that work, and then how to kind of create space. Um, and all of this was also, you know, based off an observation that these industrial terminals, especially because um, salt is used for road de-icing in the east coast of the U.S., the northeast coast of the U.S., is something that's like highly seasonal. And so there was this whole kind of summer period in which the, um, the dock facilities became really kind of quiet and dormant. And we started to experiment with using that space um, during that time. Um, some of our other earlier work was um, doing light projections on uh, the salt pile in Chelsea. Uh, we were really interested in seeing how light could be something that could really engage with the size and scale of, uh, of the salt mountain there. Um, there was really nothing else that we could work with that could adequately um, react to the, the kind of enormity of the salt mound. Um, so we started doing these and using the light as a way to register all of the dynamic movements of the salt that really um, were responding to, uh, you know, winter storms and truck shipments coming out. And so you have this kind of landscape that's growing and disappearing um, over the course of days and weeks and seasons uh, right within the, the kind of doorstep of, of a local community. And this led to some longer term projects. Um, so this is um, Chelsea, Massachusetts, as Dan was saying. Um, this is a way that we started to kind of draw the city of Chelsea. Um, all of the, the kind of um, black ground image is um, Chelsea's industrial landscape, its industrial waterfront. And then the gray is um, its, its neighbor, its residential neighborhood. And so we, we started to kind of see this as a, a, a the 50-50 city is what we were um, started to call it that it's nearly one half residential and one half industrial. So there's this really um, stark collision between very densely settled um, immigrant neighborhoods and uh, a very heavy industrial waterfront, which created quite a bit of tension. And the kind of snaking figure that you see through here is the federal navigation channel. So it's this invisible infrastructure that really fuels the industrial waterfront in Chelsea. So years and years, generations of investment have gone into dredging this channel to bring in global ships. 
that then arrive um, on the doorstep of, of the community. Um, so this is the one of the kind of first projects that we'll talk about in Chelsea and a lot of, of what was happening with it was a real conflict in terms of the governance of the land here. Um, so Chelsea's um, municipal zoning policy was really um, developed as a reaction against state policy for the land use here. Because of all of this investment for the industrial infrastructure, the state had designated all of Chelsea's waterfront as um, marine industrial. So any th the only thing that could be developed by right on the waterfront is marine industry. And so you see the, the salt piles here um, that were there when we started this project. And then here's an oil terminal on the right. In the city, um, in reaction to that, created uh, almost the opposite local zoning policy, saying that it had, um, land use could only be for um, park use, non-industrial, non -industrial, <laughs> creating this conflict where there was nothing that was um, allowable on the waterfront. And so we started to work um, with this industrial business uh, to try to develop something that could be both and. Um, and we came up with this idea with them that was called the, the port, the publicly operated recreation territory. And um, this was really based on, on what we were learning from observing the salt pile and seeing how it related with the, the seasons, how it kind of um, impacted the, the neighborhood as a really kind of seasonal phenomenon. And how do you kind of start to build that into a land use strategy um, for the, the project? So this, again, is a calendar of the salt pile changing over the course of the year. You start to see this, this blank space emerge here in the summertime when um, the salt piles become a lot smaller, a lot of open space on the waterfront opens up. And there's a big opportunity there to think about doing different things there than just um, maintaining the industrial use. So in 2012, um, the oil terminal that you saw on the previous slides uh, was demolished as part of the project. Um, and the, the, salt, the road salt distribution facility was ex extended into that space. Um, we created a, a headquarters building for the, the road salt distribution facility. You see the ship in the background. Um, and in the kind of key of the key piece of this um, proposal was to create the seasonally shared public park landscape. So what we're seeing is the summertime use here um, for waterfront event space um, and active recreation with the covered salt pile in the background. Um, it's another view to the industrial waterway in East Boston here. And this is how it all um, looks in terms of the, the space plan. Um, so all um, headquarters building stockpile, and this is the, the kind of summer version of it. In the wintertime, the stockpile goes into this zone here, in the summer it goes back. And then this is a year round um, park space here. And the design of this is really just, it's, it's a very kind of simple um, solution to create this, this kind of changing landscape, which is basically a movable fence that can be easily relocated by um, salt dock employees with their typical equipment that they use to build the piles. Um, this is what happens every May um, or every October, I'm sorry, when the salt is, is pushed back onto the basketball court. Um, in every May it is um, pulled back, the salt is tarped, and then the basketball court itself is restriped and refreshed for um, public use of the waterfront. Uh, this was a, a billboard to advertise the, the kind of opening of um, Port Park um, the first year that it was um, open to kind of just invite the community to the waterfront. And then this is all kind of um, captured through a mem memorandum of agreement. So it's like a, a sort of um, policy tool at the scale of this project, which is basically a, a management agreement between the industrial business operator and the city of Chelsea to say that every May, um, their industrial space will be opened up for community access. And then in October, again, they will reclaim that space and use it for um, the road salt distribution. 
And so this was something that really kind of taught us a lot about um, thinking through the operations of industrial facilities as being something that is just as important as the physical design that when you start to think of, um, you know, how the, the facility changes over the course of the year, what kind of labor is involved, the, the kind of um, the kind of tools that you can use to re-envision the place completely change. We'll see how this kind of um, comes into play with some of the later projects. Uh, we also designed different stockpiling strategies for the, the salt itself. So the design wasn't really confined to public access landscape, but also how do you stockpile to preserve views towards the waterfront um, from the public streets uh, based on different scenarios for how much salt is stored. Um, the the landscape was built by dock employees and so we we developed a kind of landscape mounding strategy where um, the same tools and equipment and laborers who um, work at the salt dock can actually construct um, the park itself and instead of a traditional drawing set we actually worked through the architectural sketch um, we subcontracted all of the um, all of the contractors on the project and, and kind of just worked in this um, way to construct it. Some images of it, and this kind of um, has extended through the life of the project as well. So the dock employees again are very um, busy with the the road salt um, in the winter time and in the summertime. Their work kind of migrates over to the public park side and they are involved with the maintenance of the landscape and planting and, and so on. Um, so these are some images from 2012 when the demolition began on the project. Um, and we did, again, lighting installations because we had realized um, that at this point, you know, a lot of Chelsea residents weren't even uh, aware of um, of of the kind of opportunities on the waterfront. They lived for so many years with a kind of steel wall of oil tanks that separated them from their waterfront. So we did this series of in, uh, light installations that kind of announced the reopening of um, that space for community use. Um, the final one was this goodbye that disappeared as the tanks were being um, demolished. We also developed a recycling strategy for a lot of the elements of the oil terminal because we realized that there was a lot more that could be done with some of these physical structures. Um, so the domes that covered the tanks um, became trellises that cover uh, what you see here is a um, amphitheater and the, the kind of retaining is the former dike um, around the, the oil tank. Um, foam fire extinguishing cannons for the terminal are changed to become um, play features for water um, fountains for kids. This is a truck loading rack in the foreground that, and then a barge unloading rack here for, as a viewing platform. Truck rack is used as a sort of stage for theater in the park now. And then also just because of this kind of continued engagement between the salt dock laborers and um, the, the kind of upkeep of this landscape, we can do things like um, stage theater in the park productions, use the salt itself as a medium to support those performances. This is a Hamlet in Midsummer Night's Dream that's kind of built with the landscape. And then it's just some images of the, the park. Um, the second project that we're going to talk about is, um, you know, we started to kind of extend some of these ideas into um, other realms. Um, we began to work with the state's Department of Transportation. Um, so this is a big kind of highway interchange in Boston here. Um, and when we first kind of began working on this project, it was just sort of this um, gravel landscape. It was part of um, Boston's kind of famous big dig project. Um, and as part of this, we had done a, a study of different highway overpass um, sites throughout the state. Um, the Department of Transportation had asked us to um, take a look at how to improve the environmental impacts of their infrastructure and also to think about um, improving community connections through those spaces. And we realized that there were just so many commonalities here in terms of the types of um, challenges that um, different communities faced around highway infrastructure. And a lot of the lessons we learned in the previous project um, really became applicable to these environments. 
Um, so this is the the landscape again. We're having a, a kind of formerly industrial waterfront way on filled land um, coming, you know, alongside the the project. And it was really about creating a, a kind of access through a shared use um, pathway through this this landscape, and then um, creating a, a stormwater um, management um, park here. So this is an image of it more recently. You can kind of see an image of the pathway coming through in this boardwalk that sort of hovers around above the um, stormwater management here. And then, um, and then kind of interspersed through the, the water management landscape are a series of paved surfaces that are for um, community events and one is sized for basketball and then the other another is for a dog park which was something that had come from some of the community um, outreach process um, here you're seeing a boardwalk that kind of offers a way of walking through um, that landscape and kind of getting views between the ramps above and um, some of the things that we we kind of learned in this project and had taken from the rock chapel marine project was you know, really starting to think about how do you um, work with ideas about maintenance and operations. These projects were all funded entirely by the state's Department of Transportation and implementation was really one of the biggest um, challenges here, working with a transportation agency whose primary objective is to kind of create transportation facilities. They're not really um, um, in the business of creating park spaces, but that was exactly like what was needed here in order to kind of reconnect the it's neighborhoods. It's the case where because this is all tax dollars, mm -hmm. the, it's allocated for transportation, a great limitation of <clears throat> what the monies could be spent on. So the sort of equation in many ways became how could you leverage transportation infrastructure to create a, um, a greater public realm? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, <clears throat> Much of the lessons from the Saul Company, which were predicated on how do you integrate a basketball court into an industrial landscape, sort of merging the two, were translated here on how could we take the typical palette of infrastructural elements and create a public realm. And as we step back from that, we can just keep clicking through. It's sort of like you know uh, we can build maintenance plates to support manless well if we stripe those those are basketball courts we can't build a park but we can plant trees to support uh, stormwater management as soon as you build a path you have to light the path you can build the path for dot and it comes with lighting and benches and that so you start putting these ingredients together like yes dot cannot build a park but what they can build is uh all the they can build benches and they can build lighting that support a path and they can plant trees if they're part of stormwater management and they can build maintenance plates and so it, it, in many ways like the lessons from the salt it became how do you actually just like recharacterize these components which are maybe standard in transportation and aggregate them to effectively add up to a park the lesson from the memorandum of agreement in chelsea translated here this was a different equation where dot essentially tasked us with figuring out how do we suppress crime? How do we reduce all the sort of illicit activities that were happening under the highway uh, with, without really spending anything? And um, so the game became, how could this actually become a self-sustaining economy? Because they were not going to be able to, uh, let's say, um, maintain the landscapes, invest in the landscapes. And so in this case, it was all through the parking lots uh, that were under the highway creating an opportunity for people to get off the highway, park their cars and take shuttles into the city. That becomes a revenue source for parking. That parking could be leased to an operator. And then in that operations agreement, it is all stipulated that they have to maintain the landscape. They have to host events. So the lesson that we learned, I suppose, in the Chelsea facility about crafting a project specific memorandum of agreement translated here to a sort of nuanced lease agreement between a private parking operator and the State Department of Transportation. And so then we'll switch into another project here. Um, so this led into um, what we call the Charles Gate project. Um, and 
Whereas this last one is an example of kind of doing a retrofit on an existing piece of highway infrastructure. Charles Gate is um, actually part of um, Frederick Law Olmsted's Emerald Necklace Park System in Boston. So this is an image of the, it's actually the entry point of the necklace. And it's, um, it's at a really kind of important ecological intersection where the Muddy River, which is the, the kind of waterway that the Emerald Necklace is designed around, converges with the Charles River. Um, and in the 1950s and 60s um, here, as it was the case in many places around the country, um, there were major highway era roadway projects that severed um, the connections between the, the two rivers, as well as a lot of the park connectivity and sort of destroyed the, the landscape here. And so now that it's 70 years after a lot of this roadway infrastructure was built, um, it sort of looks like this. Um, we are coming in, or we're working with local communities and advocacy organizations and the Department of Transportation and other state agencies to start to think about, you know, how do you take the opportunity of doing bridge repair and, um, and kind of confronting the fact that a lot of the infrastructure is at the end of its useful life and redesign it in such a way that it actually puts first um, you know people powered connectivity and ecological processes so this is what it looks like today underneath the, the boker overpass this is part of boston's emerald necklace um, but and you know some of the question we started with in all of this is like how did it become like this um, the fact that there is all of this roadway infrastructure is only part of the problem um, this is how the Muddy River looks as it's going through here. You can kind of just see that it's in poor ecological health. Um, the duckweed bloom on the, on the surface is, is just an indicator of all the pollutants that go into the waterway. And you can kind of see the direct discharge here um, and here and all of the kind of floating debris. And so how do you start to think about improving the relationship between the overpass, the highway and uh, the riverway was a major kind of concern of the project. And something that we learned that was just really um, kind of interesting to us is that when this when these roadways were built during the highway era, there was actually a park that was designed as part of it. Um, so this is the construction plan from 1967 showing this and we kind of just simply illustrated it here. And you see a couple of slides ago in the picture of how this park looks today, all of that's just missing. Um, there's no green, there's no pathways, there's no benches to sit in. And so some of the things that we started to strike us was just trying to figure out, well, how did it become the way it did today? Like there were, you know, intentions at least 70 years ago to create a public space under the highway. And then it, they, these things just- On um, two occasions, a park was erased. First, mm -hmm. Frederick Law Olmsted's mm -hmm. famed Emerald Necklace was erased. And then a second landscape park in the 60s built was erased. Uh, and it really struck us that that lack of designed integration between the infrastructure and this park is what sort of ultimately led to the demise. And we went through the archival record and saw that every time they did a maintenance project here, they just kept demolishing and removing and there was no because they were kind of contradicting to each other and it became from all of our previous work like when marie showed a, the duckweed blooms this great like it was so obvious that the the relationship between the highway and the river is what had never been designed they were treated like separate entities and separate jurisdictions these diagrams were just our effort to even trace the jurisdictional confusion where every color represents a different jurisdictional mix. So how could anyone even be held responsible for the water that was being discharged into the river when it's flowing between four different jurisdictions? So when a drop of water hit the road and then when it exited to the river, it had flown through four different state agencies. So much of the design has been a process of like dissecting those relationships, the kind of ecological links between infrastructure and the river and recomposing them to similarly evaluating what are the maintenance regimes that have to happen on the site here you're seeing that the basic act of trying to clean the water sheet destroys the land um, uh, obviously here the kind of health of the river and the poor relationship between drainage systems into the river that are effectively destroying the river and so some of the really direct lessons from the previous project applied here in terms of thinking through like how do you build in 
access ways for larger equipment to come underneath the, the overpass in order to do maintenance and structural inspections. So that's what you're seeing in this kind of orange bubble here. How do you create stormwater management under that, that tr filters, treats the, the runoff from the overpass above through landscape systems? And um, in this case, this was a, a project that we started and did, you know, all a lot of different kinds of um, outreach in order to find to figure out what, what the kind of priorities and goals were for it. Um, starting with charrettes, walking tours, um, meeting with the, the maintenance crews that would have to take care of the landscape. And over the course of five years now, there's been a coalition of over 30 advocacy groups and um, five or six different state organizations that have come together to kind of um, in a shared vision um, around the project. Um, and what's interesting is, and you see in the red here, is because um, a lot of the infrastructure needs to be rebuilt at this time, there was the opportunity to really rethink how do you do this in such a way that you're eliminating a lot of roadway. Um, so in the previous project, we were just kind of retrofitting an existing highway landscape. And in this case, we're actually removing quite a bit of um, roadway and bringing it away from the river and um, trying to kind of reorient all of the priorities in this area so that it's really privileging um, people's movement, non-vehicular movement from the Back Bay Fens, the Emerald Necklace to the Charles River and uh, beyond. And so this is the vision plan that these advocacy organizations, neighborhood groups and um, city and state agencies got around, um, got behind together and a series of the picture of the kind of before and after images that we've used to kind of show the vision for how this area can transform from something that is really automobile oriented and infrastructurally heavy into something that is much more reflecting the natural processes and um, human level connectivity between um, essentially trying to transform from an infrastructure dominated landscape to a public realm first landscape that integrates those same infrastructure systems so you know a, a major priority for the state is of course to not lose any of the traffic connectivity in the area but really instead of like designing the landscape first around those efficiencies how do you sort of shape and sculpt those infrastructure systems around that kind of prioritization of a positive public realm and then um, this is the Malden River Works project um, we've been working on for about three years now. Um, this is this has a lot of similarities with the, the early kind of salt dock work. It is a public works facility in Malden, which is a, a city just north of Boston on the Malden River, um, another industrial waterway. And um, this project is to envision how to create a public park on uh, the riverfront here. This community has no public park space on their river. It's all been kind of historically separated because of industrial activities here. Um, and the kind of uh, and this project was kind of initiated through um, the Leventhal City Prize at MIT, which was um, the theme of that prize was um, projects that are looking at how to develop models for equitable resilience. So that was a real opportunity to kind of create front and center a priority about um, community led resilience and I'll get into that in just a second. So this, uh, these are some images of what that uh, facility looks like on the ground. Um, that you know, you can see that it's um, a lot of roadwork debris, salt pile in the background, a big maintenance garage facility, um, a lot of issues with ponding and drainage, um, snow removal they do here, and all of the street sweeping, street um, all that kind of debris. So it's a very kind of heavily used industrial landscape, but it also happens to be on this really beautiful um, river. And so the, the redesign here was to think about how to consolidate and um, clean up all of the public works activities and kind of reorganize them in such a way that they could be moved away from the riverfront in order to create space for a public boathouse and um, to restore the, the river landscape, create a new community boating dock and, um, and so on here. And um, this is just looking at some of the reorganization of the, the site and create opportunities for, um, you know, the 
for residents to begin to kind of engage with the public works um, activities, uh, create moments for kids to be able to watch the machines, um, you know, working in the yard, um, ways to envision um, or see how drainage is being treated through natural processes, uh, which you're seeing here and think about different forms of resilience. And this project was, was kind of looking at resilience through four different dimensions. Um, disaster recovery in the sense that a public works is a second responder in terms of, um, of those issues, um, economic resilience, trying to come up with a both and model like the first project in terms of preserving industrial uses, but also bringing in public access improving for climate preparedness and then social resilience too so this project for us was like a real opportunity to think through from the beginning how do you um, design a very deliberate governance process that foregrounds um, communities of color in terms of thinking about the development of a new kind of shared waterfront open space and how do you do that in such a way that you um, create productive collaborations with local government and so we um, worked with residents to come up with this model here where um, a steering committee is um, is uh, made up of resident leaders of color and um, local environmental advocates, city government representatives who work with a project team, which is ourselves and um, waterfront planners, city planners. And, um, and together we developed an outreach strategy for the project um, that has evolved over the over time as the project itself has developed. Um, so you're seeing steering committee meetings, the project team, um, and some of the, the public outreach um, process. And through the, the kind of um, seed grant that we got for, with MIT, we were able to do a year long um, concept design process that allowed us to create this um, document that kind of captured all of the um, all of the vision that um, Malden residents had kind of come together around and we use that now to um, help um, help with guide the direction of the project as we move forward. <clears throat> so just really to conclude, this is perhaps a project we didn't really even realize we were doing, but it's quickly become maybe one of our favorites. Uh, so the salt work has continued throughout our kind of time of operating landing studio. So as Marie said, we really started this work in around 2005, formalized our firm in 2011, and have consistently worked since 2005 in Chelsea, Massachusetts, particularly on what's called the marginal corridor, which even the name of the street, we, we kind of love because it's right on the margin. There was a convention in the Boston, Massachusetts, New York area of naming streets at the interface of the city and industry, marginal streets. And what you see here is just, uh, you know, this is what I mean, we kind of didn't even know we were doing it, but over time we just kept working on projects and and quickly realized sort of like the salt, it, it's less about the salt than all the systems and all the interfaces of how it relates to a community. The salt is the salt, but you know, how does it embed itself in a neighborhood? And we quickly realized it was the landscapes, the gardens, the houses, the systems. When we developed Port Park, we saw an astronomical rise in property values in the area. All of a sudden, the labor force was having a difficult time to even afford property in the area. And so quickly, the company has had to start developing worker housing policies. And so essentially over now, I suppose it's 18 years or so, we've been undertaking uh, sort of dozens of projects, some temporary and uh, um, installations and some sort of at a much larger planning scale, some architectural projects. As I mentioned, some of the housing projects have really been about restoring um, very significant kind of monuments of architecture in the area. Again, kind of capitalizing on the labor force uh, and the machinery to build things like massive granite blocks out of salvaged seawalls. Um, a major initiative we've been working, we've planted over 400 trees uh, over the years to kind of reduce urban heat island. It's just like a very paved place. And so even things like integrating vegetation strategy with the worker housing. Um, uh, and then more kind of temporary partnerships with the city. This is an example, obviously, recently from the kind of pandemic of converting the sort of port, the port park space actually as an emergency food hub, which was delivering food to 5,000 families per week in Chelsea, Massachusetts. Chelsea was very badly hit um, by COVID 
Uh, so, so it becomes these kind of like momentary transformations along the corridor or more permanent. This is a, a water easement pipe, which we developed a small park over, which is used as birthday parties. And again, we, we sort of love this new relationship where maybe back uh, prior to a lot of this work, no one ever would like interface with the industry. It would be something that was just sort of thought of as other um, and there was no kind of positive exchange. And, and now, you know, there are birthday parties with loaders on the waterfront. Um, so there's these kind of new typological um, relationships, uh, conversions of old buildings. These are sort of in process projects right now. Um, uh, even strange kinds of relationships come about. This was a junkyard space that we were trying to clean out and very quickly some neighborhood groups said, oh, but we've been taking care of cats in the area. And so had to sort of relocate the cats because they were living in cars that were abandoned cars that were being cleaned out. So sort of a whole cat colony. And this is a great project because some of the immediate sort of back in 2005, some of the environmental advocacy groups that were even sort of maybe let's say on the other side of the fence when negotiating about developments, we're now really collaborating with, this is a, a project to convert a, um, what seemed like kind of a underutilized warehouse turned out to actually be a historic horses stable wrapped in corrugated metal. We're partnering with a local hospital and an environmental advocacy group to turn this into a food nutrition um, kitchen. Which, again, I think when we started this work, sort of like the salt investigation, we never expected that we would start studying salt and end up learning about the sort of monumental protests of Gandhi overthrowing a British monopoly and branding strategies for how to get, you know, super high values in fancy restaurants. And, and similarly, you know, we sort of learned from that all these kinds of social and community and culture integration that in many ways, the, the game of integrating a salt facility into the life and care of a community is maybe through a food nutrition kitchen. Um, uh, and like I said, these kind of landscaping strategies and Marie's emphasized several times really thinking, which I'd say is another lesson from the salt operations of the labor systems and how to work maybe outside of typical architectural conventions with the sort of the people on the ground. Um, uh, maybe how Marie mentioned earlier, working more through the architectural sketch than formalized drawings, which really disempower some people from being able to work in the building trades, but in this sense, really empower people to build their own environment. Here are sort of uh, community gardens that we were co-building with Another, uh, this is a Blue Cross Blue Shield volunteer group working with the salt facility to build an urban agriculture farm that's gonna be linked with that nutrition kitchen. And so I think like the salt, uh, it's, it's kind of that lesson of to design just infrastructure is, and that's again, the sort of title of this presentation is really to look at all the other dimensions and variables and dig into those community and culture systems, economic, and, and really feel how we can tune all those systems um, which often takes us far afield from the sort of the original terminals themselves. Uh, so thank you, and obviously happy to discuss further and questions. Excited to hear any thoughts you have. Could you could you hear us, Dan and Marie? Yeah, yeah, we hear you now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, and you can hear me now? Yes. Yep. I think we have this so that we can grab a few questions uh, if anyone in the audience has some. I want to thank you for really such a stupendous presentation, which um, is so relevant to so much of the work which is going on right now uh, uh, at our school. So it's, it was really, really helpful. Um, to see. I have a number of questions myself, but maybe even before I might do that, I wanted to sort of ask uh, those of you who are here, does anyone have a question want to kick us off? Or we, we believe you should be able to ask from where you are, but if they can't hear, you can come a bit closer. Anyone have any questions? I've got one, but I'll let you start. <laughs> Unless there are students that have questions. 
there's a question. Oh, you're not a student. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not a student, but uh, maybe if you don't have any question, maybe you can tell us what is the thing that strikes you most, like that you, you know, that take like, that was really interesting to you. What was, what was the element that you thought was like, shattered your way of thinking about architecture? Did you think that this could be architecture? Okay, why not? Tell us. Um, can they hear? I think you can still, can you hear when we speak in the audience? We heard the questioning from the, the person asking the students, you know, what was striking them, but we can't hear if any students responding. Okay, yeah, I think they were still, someone was about to. Did you want to? Oh. Yeah, go for it. Uh, I guess what striked me the most was that it was really interesting to see, to see how you can transition from salt into just evolving beyond that. And it was, at the end, wasn't about salt. It was more, more about the community and building that relationship with them. So it's like the volume of Could you catch that, Anna Marie? Yeah, no, and I mean, I think I mentioned it really briefly, but you know, what this work started is we were actually in a class in graduate school and we were wandering around in Chelsea and we were tasked with investigating the city. And we went up there to look at sort of some community gardens, which ironically we've ended up like redesigning since then, which is this is how this stuff goes, like totally weird, uh, you know, full circle. And we looked down the street and there's this salt company and we wandered in and, you know, we started talking to the terminal manager and what was so interesting about the conversation, he wasn't talking about like physical stuff. He was talking about the relationship, you know, and he was, and it, it became really clear that it's, it's about these kind of, how do you re-sculpt relationships like industries, infrastructures, they're very kinetic operating systems. They're not like a fixed entity. And I think for us as a launch to our career, and that's where the SALT became such an interesting study, was to really think of architecture as a series of relationships, which of course it is inherently, as you probably all know that, but, um, and it really changed, I think, the way we thought about architecture from being, you know, how could you like house this uh, operation or this, you know, lifestyle or whatever, to how could you actually tweak interrelationships between things, in this case, between communities and industrial operations. And so, yeah, the SALT just became a study of, hey, let's go look at relationships around the world and understand how those are structured by space and uh, context. Yeah, can I can I maybe follow up on that? Because when I heard the talk and saw your images, um, one thing I noticed is that a lot of your projects have a very linear quality, and some of um, and some of that is some of that is doubtlessly due to the fact that you often work with edges or you work with with passageways. But I also felt that the linearity of your projects and also the way that you presented them, it seems to be very strongly telling a story, like the salt has become a character in a narrative. And I was wondering if you could maybe comment a bit more about that. And you talk about relationships and you didn't mention storyline yet, but I'm sort of wondering if that's at the back of your head or not. Just curious. Well, yeah, it's funny you, you, you use linear in two different ways. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think we've been, one, the character of the sites, and it is interesting to us. I mean, these are things we reflect on. I guess infrastructure just literally has like a linear characteristic often because it's about like connections, right? So roads, water edges, rail lines, <laughs> they're pretty linear things. And they're kind of interesting because where architecture is like fixed objects, infrastructure tends to like cut through communities cut through systems, whether it's electrical or sewerage, you know, we work. And so they, you know, as a very fundamental, basic architectural concept, they don't sort of reside in a simple place, you know, even on one end of the line, it's in one kind of community and another, it's in another. And so, you know, you have to kind of negotiate that transect. Uh, we talk a lot in other aspects of our work about like ecotones, about how different sort of systems are merged. So yeah, no, the very fundamental linearity. 
The other aspect of the linearity you talk about is the kind of narrative sequence. And I think for us, yeah, like we were, you know, there's several aspects of the types of clients and types of relationships. I mean, one thing we reflect a lot on is we've been very sort of like blessed in our practice to have long term relationships with clients, which is sort of atypical in architecture today. So often architecture is sort of like you're contracted, you do a project and you effectively are done and leave, um, which is a really problematic uh, I don't know why architects, we've kind of devolved to letting our practice become that um, when particularly in pursuit of sustainable community relationships, sustainable environmental impacts, it's all about performance over time. And the idea that you'd as an architect get like one crack at it, <laughs> like get it right, you know, show up, work for a year, see if you get it right and leave and you know maybe check it out a few years later and see how it's doing. But do you like the salt work? I mean, we've been working consistently with one client for now, I guess, nearly 20 years in a perpetual effort to kind of refine and refine and refine a relationship, uh, which is, a, you know, which is a historic way that when architects work more kind of locally within communities representing towns in their local place, I think was more conventional. And so for us, it is very kind of a like sort of a narrative. I mean, obviously, in the, in the format of a lecture and a PowerPoint, that gets a little stronger because we're post rationalizing a lot. But the idea that we're able to kind of try, see a reaction, try again, sculpt it, a relationship forms that opens up new opportunities. It for us is a very kind of aggregating um, process and Certainly in our career, one project leads to the other because quite literally, you know, Department of Transportation hired us because we were working on the salt work and they had read about that and seen the impacts of that on some state legislation and whatnot. And um, so one, there is a very kind of linear progression of this work in time. I think something we all also talk about a lot is that our own um, interests in these places and and kind of motivations and goals have kind of evolved over time as we've learned more i mean the salt work started just with you know some sense of wow this is a really different thing that we very unfamiliar landscape it clearly didn't fit where it was but we didn't have any grasp of the you know environmental justice issues that were happening there and all of the things that the communities were grappling with and those are things that like over the course of years and years, you begin to engage with differently and the relationships have changed over time and the ways that we're working with different groups have changed because we've been able to be there for um, a really long time. Um, Dan and Marie, if I can sort of piggyback off of that, I just would, any other questions or can I ask the Final question. So, just you've you've spoken to this, and I think in a way, Marie, you just sort of touched on it. But um, because I know also that online, uh, some of the uh, MR students are watching, who are sort of in the midst of their own process, as are uh, all the students who are in, engaged in the the research studios. Um, and really, my final question is just about this word research. Um, partly because I think one of the things which I find so phenomenal about uh, the work of your studio is the links that you're able to make from, on one hand, the sort of global research project, looking at environments and even sort of systems of, of sort of capital, capitalist exploitation of the Earth's resources, um, and yet in the same almost like breath, uh, it's engaging everyday people like normal guy on the street or person next door um, in a very kind of hyper local and kind of immediate context of their everyday lives. Um, uh, so sort of very large scale to the sort of very immediate and, and contextual. Um, and I'm just curious how you, you in a way feel like the idea of research um, factors into these processes, maybe partly on one hand, um, almost in the way that you camouflaged a park by saying it's just about stormwater management and safety or things like this, um, and you're able to del deliver a park, were there ways in which you felt that you camouflage aspects of research when engaging with certain kinds of stakeholders? Um, or did you feel that people were sort of equally will ready and willing and open to kind of engage in conversations of almost like open-ended research? as opposed to 
doing a particular thing, like putting in a garden or doing something very tangible? How did other people relate to the notion of research? And how do you feel like research has a kind of explicit role um, in your practice when you're actually designing and building sort of, you know, nuts and bolts architecture with foundations, as well as this more amorphous aspects of community building? Yeah, no, great question. I mean, I think design research, especially because we're both sort of in the academic side of things, is I think something that our discipline even often sort of struggles to define, right? Because uh, it is a really nuanced form of research. Uh, I, I think a really powerful kickoff point for us, uh, for me anyway, I was, I marvel, I still love, my, one of my favorite projects Marie showed it was that basketball court at the salt pile. And it, it, it was a really kind of fascinating form of research for us. And, and it goes to the last question about sort of sustained relationship that we could sort of like engage with community groups, engage with the industry to drill into the industry enough to understand its operations, dissect Marie showed literally, and I like the way you referred to it, it's the first time you've referred to it that way, was that silhouette drawing and literally a space in the season of time. Like you make a drawing to analyze an industry, see that there's a void and say, well, what else could be in that void? And obviously in our climate there's, and then, and then build it, <laughs> see how it interrelates, um, learn from that, that there were all these sort of maintenance operations that there were like, it has changed since we've built it, like the fence details, the way it's maintained every year, what we've had to do, and then translate that to another project. So that to us, like, I love that project because I, I, first off, I love it because it's like, it's ugly. It's like ugly. <laughs> it's like these horrible concrete blocks and this fence that's all rickety, <laughs> not very nice. And it's not detailed. There's no architectural invention that's literally residual concrete left from con I mean, it's the, it's like the worst materials you could build with. And yet it's the most utilized like active recreation space in Chelsea because of its integration with all these systems. And so it challenges all of our kind of norms of, Hey, what does it take to make like a nice park? Well, it's a piece of asphalt with a horrible residual concrete rickety fence. And, um, <clears throat> and then, you translate that to all those same logics. So it creates a new typology. And that's where I found design research so fascinating here. It's like, okay, you have a global system of salt. It intersects a local community that's desperate for recreation space. You intersect that with a careful analysis of industrial operators, and you can actually invent a new architectural typology. And what we didn't show is then you link that, Marie talked about it with the memorandum of agreement with like new modes of policy. And that's actually changed codification in Massachusetts for how they um, allow public recreation in these intensely industrial zoned areas. Like it taught us that like, you know, once you can create that new archetype, then you can write new code legislation and actually allow for that as a new standard. All of that, of course, you know, took six, you know, a number of years to kind of play out. But that kind of like, careful analysis of a few systems, looking for those points of overlap, enacting it, seeing how, like, how that could develop a new archetype. And then that became the framework for launching like the under highway work from a maintenance perspective of literally building a basketball court there to maintain a highway. Um, do you have anything you want to add? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I think it's just some of it too is, is we, we spend a lot of time trying to reflect on what we've learned from project to project. Like, I think a form of research as well as just trying to pull out what it is you're taking from one project and bringing into another. And for us, we often kind of say to each other that and, to, and within Landing Studio that like our kind of realm of design invention is an implementation. Like we get a lot of energy out of figuring out how to make things happen. And it often takes a very long time to get to that point and a lot of positioning to figure that out. Um, but that's why like a rickety fence detail doesn't matter much to us because we're just trying to see like, how do you actually make that change happen? And that is something that's been, you know, kind of something that can kind of reappear from project mm -hmm. to project. Um, not necessarily, you know, physical formal design, but much more so how do you get over these policy hurdles, jurisdictional hurdles. Those are the really the things that tie up industrial and infrastructural landscapes. That's what makes them take so long. 
And that's where we're always trying, looking for ways to, to figure out how to take something we're learning from one space into another one. No, and I think Marie showed a drawing. We didn't have a lot of time to talk about it, but the, it's like, it's fascinating to us how certain like architectural um, norms become the kind of breakthrough moment in projects. So something like with Charles Gate, we did all this research to understand where did these parks go? How did these get destroyed? What's the misalignment here that's killing Olmstead parks? I mean, that's pretty intense. It's as if like a big chunk of Central Park just got like wiped out. How, how'd that happen? Um, and as we looked into it, we realized there was a lot of jurisdictional discord. And it wasn't until we started looking into the stormwater drainage system and realizing, oh, wow, this whole system is broken because it's completely fragmented. Who's responsible for what? And nobody could see that. Nobody could imagine it until you literally assign like, well, you know, we're going to give city of Boston orange and state transportation red. And, you know, and then you see the map all of a sudden and it all of a sudden is clear. It's like a shattered system that there's no um, uh, authority and there's no, what's the word? Uh, accountability. accountability. <laughs> and so, and then you realize, oh, wait, we just made a system that all we have to do is like reassign colors. <laughs> and like all of a sudden now there is accountability. It's like, you know, in Illustrator, you change a line from like orange to red and like, wow, it's like now there's accountability. This is nonsense, you know, but until the drawing was made, you couldn't have that conversation. And so like the design research became drilling through, finding the old maps, talking to the agencies, being like, well, do you care for that pipe or do you care for that pipe? Okay, that's your pipe. Okay, it's orange, you know? And then all of a sudden the map is clear. The drawing is probably the most innovative thing in that project because then you can literally change the colors and be like, okay, now we're, who's responsible for what in a sort of logical way? Um, so yeah, those kinds of, those are really exciting moments when the conventions of architecture lead to a discovery that can re-articulate like a vision of a place so then it can be implemented and acted upon. What a powerful testament to the power of architecture. Dan and Marie, thank you again from all of us here at the Stockton School. Thank you so much for taking this time to share with us and uh, we wish you all the best for the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. I was going to say, BK, we'll follow up. We're really disappointed we couldn't come out there, but we have these two little kids that make it very hard to <laughs> get on planes. Either. They're very little. <laughs> we look forward to being able to get you here at some point. Thanks again so much. Yeah. Um,